Prime Time Local News, serving the Lakeland and Midwest regions. Good evening and welcome to Prime Time Local News. This year's construction season is winding down in Lloydminster, but City Council is already looking ahead to next summer. The city will be applying for provincial funding to fix a major portion of Highway 16. Eric Bay reports. Your morning commute might look a little different next summer if the city receives the $2.3 million it is requesting from Alberta's Municipal Stimulus Program. The grant would cover over half the cost of the project, repaving Highway 16 from this intersection here at 62nd Avenue all the way west to 75th Avenue. Damage to the road can no longer be patched and councillors say the potential funding provides relief to the city's budget. We receive money from gas tax, the gas tax fund as it's re explained from the federal government through the province to the city, but in comparison to the costs of maintaining 16 and 17 highway, it's extensive. So any time an opportunity, and Councillor Fagnan mentioned this as well, it's a 50 cent dollar. We cannot miss that opportunity to improve the condition of the infrastructure. 70th to 75th Avenue will see an overlay to the road surface, but more extensive work is needed from 62nd to 66th. Deterioration of the road in that area requires blading before any resurfacing of the highway. If the substructure below the asphalt won't hold the weights that are going on, you'll get more damage to the asphalt. So simply to remove the asphalt and replace it, we would be in the same mess in less than 10 years. The College Drive intersection, which was repaired this summer, is included in next year's plan. Concrete blocks, similar to those at other intersections along Highway 16, will be installed. The city says the intersection couldn't wait another year before being fixed. It was a safety concern. We heard very clearly from the community there was issues. So with a very small amount of dollars spent, that was resurfaced to get us through until next year. That asphalt will be ripped up because we have to do the infrastructure underneath. The mayor added repairing the highway will improve maintenance. If the road's smooth, it'll be easier to clean in the winter. If it's smoother in the summer, you'll have a more enjoyable ride and you won't be bouncing through potholes. So it's a process that we go through. With provincial funding, the project would still cost the city $1.9 million and is planned for next summer. Eric Bay, Primetime Local News. The COVID-19 pandemic has made this school year look a lot different. And in this year, school year's first Beyond the Classroom, we look at how the Lloyd Minster Catholic School Division has made videos to help their students adjust to the changes. You will stand in the designated spots and stay in your own space. This is one of the many videos LCSD is using to show students and staff proper procedures to avoid the spread of COVID-19 on school property. They created videos for multiple different scenarios in the schools. We have videos about hand washing, so making sure to use a lot of soap and to wash their hands for 20 seconds. We have procedures for filling bottles. All of our schools have bottle filling stations um, for the students to fill, um, as well as sanitizing in and out of the classroom. Um, all of our classrooms have hand sanitizer available to the students if hand washing isn't easily um, or readily available. The school division's group, Prevention with a Purpose, put these videos together with the help of both staff and students. Prior to COVID, we had a group of staff that came together for aspiring leaders. And we would get together and talk about leadership type activities. Well, as soon as COVID hit, we realized that there was an opportunity for our aspiring leaders to learn from our actual leaders or individuals in leadership roles on how we were going to be able to respond to all the changing needs of COVID. At Ecole St. Thomas, they have a lot of younger students. Being able to show these videos to the kids and letting parents know the procedures will help create less confusion. I think it was a, it's a big information piece and also to, um, so that the whole entire school division is on the same page about these policies and procedures so that you're not getting um, one procedure that's different in one building from the other and parents, parents talk and so they, can, they know that what's happening in one LCSD school is happening in all the LCSD schools. A few students from LCSD are featured in the videos which the staff said they were very excited to participate in. Every student I asked was like they would love to. In fact, I, we still have one sort of idea that we might um, get together and do another one, and I've already got two students who've already stepped forward and said they'd be game to do it. The videos are available on the division's website. 
You have goals, and Lakeland College can help you achieve them. Visit lakelandcollege.ca or email hello at lakelandcollege.ca. Thank you, Jasmine. Taking a look now at our evening temperatures. Currently 11 degrees here in Lloydminster, and that was very similar to what we saw throughout the entire day. Looking at some temperatures from around the region, 15 in Vermilion, 13 in Marwain and in St. Paul, 12 up in Bonneville, Cold Lake, and Lac La Biche, 19 over in Edmonton. Looking now on the Saskatchewan side here, 15 degrees in Macklin, 10 in North Balford, 11 in Maidstone, 9 in St. Walbert, 12 in Meadow Lake, Pierceland, and in Green Lake. If we look now, there shouldn't be any precipitation coming overnight, but we could be seeing some fog coming in, rolling later in the night, but dissipating by early in the morning. Looking overnight in North Balford, it will be 5 degrees before 16 tomorrow with a mix of sun and cloud. Very similar in Cold Lake, 4 degrees is the low today before 16 tomorrow. Again, a mix of sun and cloud. If we look now at some overnights for the region, all hovering around that four, three degree range, much nicer than what we saw last night where everywhere was hovering right around that minus one, minus two range there. Uh, if we take a look now at the three day forecast, 16 degrees, as I mentioned, is the high for tomorrow before four degrees as the low uh, 23 on Friday, nice sunny day with a 6 degree low uh, before 23 on Saturday. Saturday will kick things off for the weekend. Unfortunately, it will cool down a little bit as next week starts up and goes on. That's all we have for weather for now. We'll be back after the break with more news and sports. With all four major sports underway, there is lots to talk about in national news. Eric Bay joined myself in breaking it all down. Well, a lot of national sports are going on in a little bit of time. Joining me today to break them down is Eric Bay. Eric, thanks for joining me. No problem. Like you said, tons of stuff to talk about. Now, if we look at the NBA, just to kick things off, uh, the Toronto Raptors, obviously a little bit of a uh, disappointing ending especially in that game seven versus the Boston Celtics they uh, just didn't come up to perform especially a handful of players uh, specifically on my mind Pascal Siakam there is another team joining them in the disappointing category uh, as of last night the LA Clippers blew a huge lead losing game seven to the Denver Nuggets uh, Eric I guess, first of all, Canadian Jamal Murray has really gone off this playoffs, but specifically last night, putting up 40 points. I mean, this guy is just amazing. Yeah, that's the only way to put it. And you look at what he has done in this playoffs, he's really elevated his game. And that's what you have to do in the playoffs. Obviously, you need your big guys to perform. And you brought up the Raptors. That's kind of what didn't happen, especially in that game seven. And again, you bring up the Clippers as well. That didn't happen. But I think the one thing out of all this that is kind of funny is I know you said it's a disappointing end for the Raptors, and in a way it is, but I think they did go a little bit further and push the, the Celtics to the brink and went a little bit farther than a lot of other people may have thought, and it's kind of funny when you look at Kawhi Leonard and he said he, he didn't think the Raptors had what it took to win and didn't resign there for that reason. Well, if Kawhi is there, I mean, I think we're easily looking at a another finals appearance for the Raptors, so... Just kind of funny how the way the cookie, cookie crumbles, excuse me, but you look at Jamal Murray and that guy's been a beast and pretty impressive to come back from two series down 3-1. Hard to do it once, even more un unbelievable to do it twice. For sure, we saw it uh, with Jamal Murray in the Utah Jazz series. It was a bit of an offensive showdown, so he was putting up 50 points in a night like it was nothing. Uh, then they go to the Clippers, who obviously are a better defensive team, and he still lights it up, especially when games matter. I mean, Game 7, 40 points, not just that. He's averaged 27.1 points over 14 playoff games, 5 rebounds, and 6.4 assists. So he's really just elevated all of his stats from, you know, maybe an average starter on most teams to being one of the most dominant players in these playoffs. Looking now, if we're talking playoffs, to the NHL, the Dallas Stars were able to get it done 
in five games, advancing to the Stanley Cup Finals. Unfortunately for the Tampa Bay Lightning, they could not do the same as they lost a, a tight one going to double OT against the New York Islanders in game five. eBay, what'd you see from this game? Yeah, first time the Tampa Bay Lightning are hitting game six, but I don't think there's really any cause for alarm. Yes, the Islanders have kind of not necessarily shut them down, limited their opportunities for sure, you know, lower shot totals than we're used to seeing for Tampa Bay. But I really think the one thing for the Islanders that's going their way is Simeon Varlamov. I gave him some heck earlier in the playoff run. He wasn't really playing up to, you know, a playoff goalie standard, but he's really shut the door these last few games, and particularly last night when you look at what he did do in overtime because really – Tampa Bay had most of the pressure. They've had all the possession, and then it was one good chance, you know, for the Islanders to win it. And Varlamov made all those saves, kind of stood on his head a little bit. So, again, I think that the Islanders need that to continue if they are going to have a chance to force a Game 7. But for Tampa Bay, I don't think there's really any need to worry. They just have to keep doing what they're doing, and those breaks will eventually come. The law of averages dictates it. Now, my only worry, I guess, with the Tampa Bay Lightning, is Braden Point going to be playing in the future Game 6 and Game 7? Because to me, that is a huge turning point for the Lightning. I mean, they've done it all playoffs without Steven Stamkos, who's usually their number, I guess, 1A, 1B, maybe center. Braden Point being the other 1A slash 1B center. But without Braden Point in this playoff series, the Islanders have won two games. The only two games that he's missed, they've won. So if Braden Point can come back, then I say no sweat it. You got Tampa Bay Lightning win it in six or maybe seven games. But without point in that lineup, I think there's just a huge hole. That is my only worry coming from the Tampa Bay Lightning. And like you said, Barlamov has really stepped up his game. Uh, we saw him get pulled even earlier in the playoffs. So nice to see if you are a New York Islanders fan. Uh, Eric, the MLB has made an announcement that we could be seeing something new coming in playoffs. Yeah, they're going to work towards their kind of pseudo bubble, if you want to call it that. Obviously, each series is going to be limited to one city, either the home team in that first kind of wild card round, and then a neutral site location the rest of the way once we get into the more traditional playoff rounds, if you want to call it that, which I think is probably the right move, trying to limit that travel. The one thing that I am most interested about or curious about is especially the fact when we get into those later series, the seven gamers like the ALCS and the World Series, the plan right now anyways is to play all seven of those games back to back, meaning no breaks in between. And you look at the playoffs, usually you have, you know, a day between kind of like the NHL. This will be interesting because I'm not necessarily sure you need, you know, a day between every game, but those pitchers are going to be taxed and we're used to, you know, shortening those rotations in a normal playoff year. Well, I don't think you can do that this year, especially if you are going seven days straight in a seven game series, if it does reach that far. So this playoffs is really going to be about who has the most depth in pitching. And I think it's really going to be important when you look at, we've talked to Tampa Bay Lightning finishing series in five games. That's going to be important. What team can get the job done the quickest and preserve those arms for later on? Well, it will be interesting to see, I guess, especially after how the MLB started off their season. A couple other things getting underway. Week two of the NFL kicks off on Thursday. The Browns take on the Bengals as well. The U.S. Open kicks off this weekend. Dustin Johnson uh, is looking like he should be the number one contender. But in golf, really, who knows week to week. Eric, it's always a pleasure getting to chat with you. For sure. Thanks. Well, another look here now at your evening temperatures. Currently 13 degrees here in Lloydminster, 12 up in Cold Lake, 16 in Athabasca, 19 in Edmonton, Edson, Rocky Mountain House, Red Deer, and in White Court, and 23 over in Jasper. Looking now on the Saskatchewan side, 10 in Melfort, 12 in, in Saskatoon, 12 as well in Prince Albert, and in Meadow Lake, 11 in North Balfour. Looking now at the northern parts of each province, 20 degrees in Grand Prairie, 13 in Slave Lake, 18 in Peace River, 11 in Fort McMurray, and 14 over in High Level. Looking now in the Saskatchewan side, 7 in Flin Flon as well as in La Range, Wollaston Lake, and in Stony Rapids, 8 in South End, Buffalo Narrows, and in La Loche. Looking now on the southern portions of the provinces, 22 in Lethbridge, 19 in Medicine Hat, as well as in Calgary, 17 in Coronation, and 20 over in Banff, 15 in Estevan, 11 in Yorkton, 12 in Regina, and 14 in Moose Jaw, 15 also in Swift Current, 
and in Kindersley. Looking now at the national temperatures, 19 degrees in Vancouver. They're still seeing that smoke and that haze from the fires going on. 16 up in Whitehorse and 9 in Yellowknife. As we move more and more out east, 10 degrees in Winnipeg, 23 in Toronto, 19 in Quebec City, but it felt much, much colder. It was a very windy day all around parts of Quebec. 14 in Halifax and 11 in St. John's. St. John's is under a tropical warning, uh, tropical storm warning rather, as there is a hurricane starting to move its way on the east coast there. Uh, taking a look now at your school day forecast. Going to start off the day at just a low 6 degrees, but by the time school is up, that should bump up 10 degrees to 16 by the time the kids are off school. Continuing on temperatures for tomorrow, 17 in Wainwright and Vermilion, 16 also in Marwayne, St. Paul, Bonneville, Cold Lake, and Lac La Biche, 19 over in Edmonton. Looking on the Saskatchewan side now, 16 in North Balford and in Maidstone, 14 in St. Walbert, 15 in Meadow Lake, and in Pierceland. Looking now at your seven-day forecast, 16 degrees, as I said, is the high for tomorrow. The low is 4 degrees. For 23 and sunny on Friday, that will warm things up for at least for Friday and for Saturday. Unfortunately, Sunday, it will be 16 degrees with a 50% chance of rain before 18 degrees on Monday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we will see a mix of sun and cloud with that sun peeking through just enough to keep it warm. 16 degrees on Tuesday and 19 on Wednesday. That's all we have for the weather for now. We'll be back after the break with more news. I'm speaking with Jacqueline Weed from Big Brothers and Big Sisters here in Lloydminster. How are you today? I'm great. Thanks for having us. Of course, no problem. Now, I kind of wanted to talk about for the month of September, how many kids are waiting right now? So uh, normally we do a huge recruitment campaign in September. It's um, our for our Big Brothers, Big Sisters movement. It's Big Brother, Big Sister month every September. And we really focus on the recruitment. So across Canada, there are 15,000 children waiting to be matched with a mentor, uh, which sounds like a very huge number. Um, in our community right now, there are 36 children waiting to be matched with a mentor. So that's in our traditional match program and our in-school mentor program. Okay. And can you kind of explain more on uh, some of the programs available right now for Big Brother? Sure. Big Brother? So, sorry, we have the traditional match program where we match... Um, uh, screened and trained adults uh, to be mentors with children um, and youth in our community facing adversity. So the parents um, come to us and say they'd like their child to have a positive role model in their life. Um, and then we match according to interest and uh, hopefully a friendship forms. And they, get, they connect once a week um, until very recently it was virtually um, and doing activities that way. We have given Matt is the option if they're comfortable in their bubble and their circle uh, to meet in person. Um, but COVID has definitely um, taught us how to be flexible. And so we do have that flexibility of meeting virtually or in person. Um, and we were, we've been very lucky during COVID to actually start some new matches as well. So we've had people come forward to volunteer. So that's fantastic. Um, and then we're looking in the fall to start in the next month or so to hopefully start in school mentoring back up in our schools, which will be virtual again this, this year rather than in person. And have you noticed at the start of September and the school year in general that there's been some changes, anything for Big Brother Big Sisters? Um, no, they're all just being a little cautious about meeting, um, maybe going back to virtual for a bit just until they see what happens. But everyone is just so excited to be able to see each other and connect again, which um, I think is a huge, a huge issue for the kids. Um, you know, since March, they were fairly isolated. Um, there's a lot, you know, there's toxic stress, there's just that, that impact on their mental health. So it has really been, um, I believe, 
improved on by going back to school and being able to, you know, at least see other people and have conversations outside of your, your circle. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to kind of talk about the virtual wing eating competition. I was looking on your Facebook page. Could you kind of elaborate a little bit more on that and what it is for Big Brother Big Sisters? So Lloydminster Canets are organizing a virtual wing eating competition. Um, they're looking after the registration, um, getting people organized for it. And the proceeds from the wing eating competition will go towards Big Brothers Big Sisters and the Lloydminster Community Youth Centre. So if people are wanting to get involved with that, they can uh, check out the poster on our Facebook page, or they can uh, get in touch with the Canets and they'll get them all registered and all organized and ready to go. And has the support from residents still been strong, especially during COVID-19? Uh, we've had a huge support from the community. We, we also uh, take recycling so people can drop off their bottles and recycles at the office or we can pick them up. And we have had so many people that have contacted us just to say, I want to do something, I want to help. So um, that's fantastic. We have people that reach out regularly, which is awesome. So, you know, if everybody keeps continuing doing that and those that decide they want to be a mentor, get in touch with us, that would be fantastic. Is there anything else you'd like to add for residents to know about right now, especially for the month of September? Uh, no, it's really easy to be a mentor. Um, it's a lot of fun. You just need to be able to have the consistency. So once a week and you kind of schedule it with the child you're matched with. Um, and there is an application process that you go through. So if they're wanting to get involved, they can just call the office and we'll get in touch with them. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Jacqueline. Thank you. Furniture set and design supplied by Furniture Gallery and Furniture House, downtown Lloydminster. So I'm joined today with Jason Kirkshank. He's the president of Sask EV. Thanks for taking some time to talk with me today, Jason. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. So first of all, before we start, can you just talk a little bit about what uh, Sask EV is? Yeah, so we're a group of uh, EV owners and advocates uh, based out of Saskatoon. Uh, and for almost three years now, uh, we've been doing kind of events and, uh, and other work kind of around, uh, around Saskatoon and North Battleford and Prince Albert and, and kind of those areas, uh, Lloydminster as well, um, to kind of, you know, spread the, the word about electric vehicles, you know, how they work in Saskatchewan, you know, what the, what's available for charging infrastructure, stuff like that. So the main reason I uh, sparked my interest to talk with you today was um, the community charging grant that I saw uh, some information about. So can you just talk to me a little bit about that grant? Yeah, so you know, with with uh, kind of the COVID impacts this year, you know, we haven't been able to do as many events, uh, in-person events as we typically would. And so we thought this year we'd try something a little bit different. And so that's where the, the community charging grant came from. And so yeah, we're looking for kind of community organizations across the province to to apply. Uh, and then we're looking to give $2,000, uh, up to $2,000 to an organization uh, who wants to put in kind of some destination charging. Um, so this is charging that's, you know, similar to what Parks Canada just put in uh, at Prince Albert National Park and uh, Batash National Historic Site, places like that, where, you know, you can kind of drive to a destination, you know, you can spend a few hours there, uh, you know, enjoying whatever the community has to offer. Uh, and then when you go back to your vehicle, you've, your vehicle's all charged up and you're, you're ready to go back home. So um, what kind of uh, organizations or businesses or places are best for that. So you talked about things like a national park. What other businesses might uh, might use this? Yeah, so it's anywhere where um, you know people are looking to kind of spend a few hours. Uh, so the parks are a good example. Uh, you know, movie theaters are also a good example. You know, we've talked about uh, hotels and motels as well because you know there you can can go and you can get an overnight charge and be ready to go in the morning. Uh, you know, arenas, golf courses, curling clubs. You know, there's there's so many different uh, activities where you can kind of see, you know, somebody wanting to go and spend several hours uh, and then, you know, come back out to a fully charged vehicle when they're done. And so how would a uh, business um, apply for this grant? Yeah, so it's just a matter of visiting us at uh, www.saskev.ca. Uh, and then we've got uh, an application form there. We've got more details and, uh, and uh, FAQ as well. Uh, for people who are kind of looking for a little bit more detail. And, you know, we, we kind of want this as, to be an opportunity as well for different organizations to learn a little bit more about 
quote charging too. And so, you know, we've been fielding some questions about, you know, what do I look at for um, kind of charging hardware, you know, what are some different suppliers and that sort of thing. And so, I mean, we can, can help with those questions as well for people who are, who are interested in this and looking to apply. Have you had a lot of uh, different businesses and organizations throughout the province apply so far? Yes, yeah, so we've had a few organizations apply so far, and we've had had interest as well from from a few more who who might apply as well, uh, who are you know they're still just kind of looking to learn a little bit more about uh, you know what's what's included with uh, with offering something like this. And you know one of the things that we tell them is that it's really very similar to uh, any other kind of 240 volt appliance that you might have in the home or, or the workplace, something like a, a clothing dryer or a stove. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, draws, draws that kind of similar amount of power. And so it's just a matter of kind of wiring it into your, um, into your breaker panel, uh, and, you know, getting an electrician to assist with that. So, so what is uh, it like to own an electric vehicle in Saskatchewan? Um, I, it's very a rural province and a lot of the centers are spread out. So what's it like when it comes to charging infrastructure and just, you know, driving in also a cold climate? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we, uh, we purchased our EV kind of initially as a commuter vehicle. And so we live in, in Martinsville and we work in Saskatoon. Uh, and so, you know, driving every day um, into, into work. Uh, and, you know, it's been really great for that. Uh, you know, we're able to kind of drive into work, you know, park, even on the coldest days, you know, we can, can park and then come back out and start it up uh, and head back home or, you know, whatever else that we want to have, uh, whatever else we want to do that day. Uh, and then, you know, we go home and we get a full charge, uh, full charge overnight and we're ready to go the next morning. Um, but kind of as the infrastructure has improved a little bit uh, over the last year or so here, you know, we've been using it even more. You know, we have family in Manitoba and so we'll drive home with it to visit family there. Uh, and the, the fast char chargers that have been introduced on the Trans-Canada Highway, you know, they've made, you know, a really big difference in, in being able to kind of make that practical, right? I mean, obviously electricity is everywhere. Uh, so, you know, really all you need is a plug uh, to be able to travel somewhere. Uh, but the fast chargers that, you know, can deliver a, a speedy charge in a half hour and then you're on your way, uh, you know, it's really made a big difference. So. And then just before we go, uh, something else that I was kind of curious about is just how clean is uh, driving an electric car in Saskatchewan compared to other places, um, uh, you know, like maybe Ontario where they're using hydro uh, for the bulk of their electricity here in Saskatchewan, it's more non-renewable. Is it still cleaner to drive an electric vehicle than to drive a conventional gasoline or diesel? Yeah, so it is. So SAS Power actually has a really good page that they've developed on this uh, and it's available on their website. And we have some details on our website uh, as well that kind of goes into this. Uh, but electric vehicles are a lot more efficient um, than gasoline vehicles are. Um, and you know, that's, that's part of the reason why uh, you know, there is this disparity between performance in, in winter and summer is because, you know, gasoline vehicles kind of generate waste heat year round, right? Uh, and so they're able to take advantage of that in the winter, but in the summer, you know, they're still, they're still generating that. Whereas electric vehicles, they don't waste as much energy. Uh, and so there's not that waste heat that's being produced in the summer that's then having to be vented. Uh, and so, you know, they're a lot more efficient. And so that really helps them, you know, even in provinces where we have a little bit of a dirty electricity grid. Uh, but it's also a matter of, you know, these are vehicles that get cleaner every year as we add, you know, wind, solar, you know, other renewables, uh, geothermal onto our grid. Uh, and so, you know, it's, they're going to be even cleaner in five or 10 years uh, when you're still driving them uh, than they are, you know, than they are today when you buy them. So. Awesome. Well, thanks for taking some time to talk with me today, Jason. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Final look at your evening weather here. 16 degrees is the high for tomorrow with 4 degrees being the low overnight. There is a frost advisory just as a warning. 23 degrees on Friday, 16 on Sunday, and there will be some rain as well. Thanks for joining us on Primetime Local News. Have a great night.